I turn on the TV, open the newspapers, and I see stories of chaos. Chaos. Yet it is the exact opposite. This administration is running like a fine-tuned machine. In a wide-ranging news conference Thursday, President Trump fought back against accusations of disorder in his administration not yet a month old. Let's bring in Joe Watkins, former White House aide for President George H.W. Bush, Rick Tyler, MSNBC political analyst and former national spokesman for Ted Cruz, and Zerlina Maxwell, director of progressive programming at Sirius XM and former director of progressive media for the Clinton campaign. Great to have you three today. Good to be here, Dara. What a week. This Good week alone... We have seen one top Trump advisor step down, a cabinet nominee withdraw his name from consideration, and another potential advisor turn down the position. Rick, let's start with you. How is this not chaos? <laughs> Well, chaos is a subjective word. Uh, to Donald Trump, this may not be chaos. This may be indeed how he's lived his entire life. So maybe he doesn't recognize it as chaos. But to any uh, astute White House observer or people who worked in the White House, it certainly looks a lot like chaos. And, uh, and uh, look, you, you're going to lose nominees. We lost. He lost one for a cabinet post. That's uh, par for the course. Uh, but the fact that um, his pick, Har Harward, uh, for National Security Advisor decided not to take the job, mm -hmm. that's really a misstep. It, it's remarkable to me that his name got out there without a, uh, an agreement for him to join the administration. Zerlina, to be fair, is it realistic to expect the administration of a first-term president to run like a fine-tuned machine within less than a month? Well, certainly there's going to be some growing pains with any administration coming in, but we haven't even gotten through the first month of this Trump administration. Normally, it takes presidents, you know, at least two terms to have a major scandal. And what we learned this week about Russia, I think, is the takeaway, um, in addition to the, the long, sort of meandering press conference uh, that we all witnessed uh, mid day on Thursday. So I think uh, the chaos really is just, like Rick said, anybody who has eyes and firing neurons can look at what's going on and see that uh, it does not look like a fine-tuned machine at all. Hey, let's talk about Thursday. Fox News spoke to a number of Trump supporters who liked Trump's confrontational style in that press conference. One man said it was the most impressive presidential press conference of his life, largely because it was so unorthodox. It was hyper-adversarial between the president in the press and yet he was able to control the questioning and tone and the mood in the room. Joe, what's your reaction to that? Well, my reaction to that is that uh, if this was a uh, campaign mode, if he was trying to win an election, uh, clearly uh, there might be some uh uh, some positive note to that, but uh, we're in governing mode now, and the president has to govern. He's got to work with Congress, with members of the House and the Senate to, one, get his, uh, uh, on the Senate side, to get his nominees confirmed, and he's got to work with House and Senate members to get the, his legislative agenda through. And I don't see anything in that press conference that built uh, confidence uh, with, the, with the Congress, and certainly he didn't help uh, the members of, uh, of the Republican Party who have to go back to their districts and explain to their constituents, the people who put them there, uh, what's going on on right now in Washington and what's happening specifically with the White House. And and so it was not a good press conference. And according to the New York Times, some of the president's top advisors didn't want him to hold the conference at all and advised him to be less confrontational. Zerlina, who do you think was right in the end? I think the people that didn't want him to come out and be confrontational were right um, because, you know, there were some moments in that press conference that were really uncomfortable, right? When he told uh, the Jewish reporter to sit down who was simply asking about instances of anti-Semitism, which are real and are concerning. And then also the, the moment with April Ryan, who's a veteran reporter, highly respected, um, to essentially say that uh, she, she must know uh, the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, almost implying that, you know, all black people know each other and are friends. I, just seemed to be uh, really unorthodox, but in a bad way. Uh, and I think that it doesn't look like he, he really has a full grasp, uh, like Joe said, of that of the fact that we're in governing mode. You have to look like, um, you know, you're calm and, and deliberative in uh, not only your answers, but your decision-making processes, and also uh, that you're not trying to undermine the entire institution of the media, which is a very important component to holding the people in power accountable. Rick, if the president is not listening to the people that he hired to advise him, where does this lead? Well, it's funny that you say that because <laughs> <coughs> NBC's Peter Alexander stood up and listed all the um, uh, the presidential uh, non or the presidents who had gotten more electoral votes 
Uh, and then his excuse for that was, uh, that's what I was told. So maybe he should be listening to other people. But look, um, Donald Trump won the cage match coalition that's out there that loves uh, him to be combative with the media. Uh, but as far as expanding that coalition, because you, in, a, in a constitutional republic, you need a majority support to get the Congress to move. And if the Congress doesn't see that the American people are behind your agenda, uh, they're not going to move. And so far, he's not uh, broadening that coalition. Though he's about to mark the one month in office, in that press conference on Thursday, the president still felt the need to look back to Election Day. Let's take a listen. I put it out before the American people, got 306 Electoral College votes. I wasn't supposed to get 222. They said there's no way to get 222. 230 is impossible. 270, which you need, that was laughable. We got 306 because people came out and voted like they've never seen before. So that's the way it goes. And Joe, you just said that he shouldn't be in campaign mode. It's been three months. Why is he still talking about this? Well, uh, the press conference ought not be a freewheeling, uh a freewheeling uh, slugfest uh, as this one was. Uh, I think they usually are best when they're more uh, deliberate, uh, when words are chosen more carefully, uh, and when you look forward as opposed to looking back. I mean, uh, we want the President of the United States to look forward, to point us in the direction that we're headed, and to tell us what the future holds and how he's going to help us get there. Uh, we don't need to look back uh, to the campaign and, uh, and, and, and fight that battle over again. I think for the most part we need to look forward. So uh, I think uh, he didn't necessarily have help himself or, or any of us by looking back and by falsely quoting uh, the number of electoral college votes, uh, that is, how many he got with, with, with regards to others. I mean, he, he wasn't, uh, he didn't outpoint uh, Reagan, he didn't outpoint uh, George H.W. Bush and, and others. Uh, and, and that's not so important. Uh, he's the President of the United States now. Let's look forward and figure out uh, where we go as a country. Zerlina, Rick and Joe, stay with us after the break. I want to ask you about a report uh, about Russia, and there's more news on that, so stay with us.